Okay. Let's get started. All right, so um, welcome to your second week in Soccer 1010, um, Society and Culture. So um, you've probably noticed I'm a, a different lecturer to the one that you had last week. My name's Julia Cook. I'm um, much like Steve, I'm a sociology academic here at Newcastle, and um, we're kind of sharing the lectures for, for this course this semester. So um, you'll see Steve again, and then you'll see me once more a bit later on in the semester. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to, to be here today and to be involved in, um, in taking this kind of introductory course because I really enjoy introducing people to sociology, social sciences in general, because that, the whole field and the whole area has had quite a large impact on my life. So when I first started my um, undergraduate studies at university, I was, I was doing a Bachelor of Arts. I went in thinking I was going to major in politics, and then I thought I was going to major in literature, and then it was development studies, and I think I took a sociology course as some kind of, some kind of prerequisite, something I essentially had to take for one of my other potential majors that fizzled out and never really went anywhere. And then as soon as I'd taken that first sociology course, I was absolutely hooked. I found it so interesting. It, really spoke to me, really spoke to my own life and experiences. It felt really relevant and really important. And so, as you can see, I've kind of kept going with it and really made it my career and a huge part of my life. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that, at least for some of you, you'll have that same, that same kind of spark of interest in the type of material that we cover and the type of things that we talk about in this course. Because I really, I really think it's such an interesting, vital, and contemporary subject area. I think that's one of the absolute best things about studying within the social sciences. So, um, this week we're focusing on sociological theory, and the lecture is going to be divided into two sections. So, for the first around about a bit less than an hour, I'm going to be speaking to you about the the foundations of sociological theory. So classical theory, the, the kind of founding fathers of sociology, the people often call them um, white beardy men of our kind of early discipline. And then we'll have a break in the middle, um, just because I think my voice box and your attention spans will each need a little bit of time away. And then we'll reconvene and talk about social theory today, so the contemporary kind of state of of this aspect of the discipline. But first, um, a little bit of a caveat about today's lecture. So I'm going to be covering quite a large amount of material, and this is deliberate. I'm intending to give you an overview of the types of areas that sociological theorists work on, the origins of sociological theory, what it looks like in contemporary times. So this material is, by nature, very broad. And I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit about how to approach it, because I, I don't want you to think that you're expected to remember every single thing that I cover today, because that's not very realistic. And honestly, at this stage, not a tremendously great use of your time. So really, I'm wanting you to start to get a sense of some of the, the big themes and big moves within sociological theory, the types of things that theorists might work on, the, the kind of division between macro, large-scale, and micro, kind of interpersonal levels of theorizing. So I'm wanting you to take away from this kind of the, the overall points that are being made rather than all of the details. So please don't be worried that you need to be committing absolutely everything to memory. That is just not at all true. Please also keep in mind um, you'll be revisiting theory in much greater detail. Um, for those of you that are doing a Bachelor of Social Science, there's a core Bachelor of Social Science second year course that focuses purely on contemporary sociological theory. Really great course, which I'm sure you'll really enjoy. Um, 
And essentially in that course, you get to delve into some of these theorists and you also learn about you know, how, do we, how do we evaluate theory? What does theory do? So all of that material is coming. It's just not quite, not quite the right time to be getting to that level of detail yet. So um, for those of you that are interested in some of the things that I speak to you about today, what I recommend is try and pick out maybe one or two theorists where you, know, you see them and you think, oh, okay, that's really interesting, and maybe go away and once you've, once you've done all of your compulsory assigned readings, then have a look at some of the material around that theorist. Maybe ask your tutor to recommend a text that they've written because quite often there's, you know, there's certain texts that are like a bit shorter, that aren't you know, like a three-volume edition of books by Marx. So that's really how I recommend approaching this lecture. So with that being said, um, I wanted to, to kind of start with a bit of an elevator pitch for sociological theory. So, why do we theorize? Why is theory necessary? And all of those sorts of things. So essentially, the empirical parts of the discipline, so the, the work that people do, collecting data, running surveys, speaking to people, that can give us some fantastic and incredibly useful information about what's going on out there and how people understand their lives and all of those sorts of things. But that type of data on its own is less helpful for, for helping to understand like, why, why these things happen. Not just how social processes occur or what is occurring, but the why and the so what of it all. So essentially, um, sociological theory is, it provides explanations for social behavior, for things that we observe. And Theory can be purely explanatory. It can also try to interpret social behavior. So it can ask questions about, you know, what is the meaning of this specific thing? We'll, um, we'll see some, some theory that's very focused on understanding meaning and subjective understandings of the world a little bit later on today. And theory can also help us to think about how things can be different. So this is critical theory, theory that helps us to to criticize and kind of pick holes in the way in which things are, to think about you know, what could be different, how could this be better, who, who benefits from the way that things are right now, and who doesn't. So theory can help us to do a lot of really important and incredibly interesting things. I think it's one of, one of the most kind of fun elements of, um, of sociology and of social sciences more generally. So, essentially, it helps us to start to think critically and start to see patterns in social behavior. So, to begin, we're starting with the, the kind of origins of sociological theory. So, sociology itself is actually quite a young discipline, especially compared to, um, to disciplines within the natural sciences. So, Sociology began around about the time of the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, and it began in Europe. So um, we'll be speaking about uh, post-colonial <coughs> theory a little bit later on today, but it's probably um, sufficient for now to say that at this time, the, the work of sociologists were coming out of European countries. And that's not to say that people weren't theorizing and you know, reflecting and thinking about the social world. They just weren't doing what was at this time termed sociology. So, um, sociology emerged at a time of tremendous social change, especially the Industrial Revolution really accompanied huge amounts of shifts in European societies. So, the productive center of these societies moved from being agrarian based in the countryside to Kind of shifting into metropolitan areas, there was a tremendous urbanization of, of a lot of societies. People stopped working in, on farms as much, and more and more people were working in factories, which were in big cities like parts of the north of England and London especially. And so the way in which people were kind of 
spread across countries changed profoundly. And suddenly there were huge amounts of people living in very close proximity. So that brought up, it kind of brought new tensions to the fore. And at the same time as this, there was a huge reorganization in the way in which the labor market was constructed. So again, industrialization, movement into working in places like factories, um, movement away from like artisan craftsmanship towards mass production. These were huge, huge shifts. And this kind of provoked a lot of changes in, in the way society was organized and um, essentially created a lot of new uncertainties, some new inequalities, new um, what we would call social problems. So new issues arose and at this time there were very much thought of as like moral issues, but in, in a kind of contemporary language, we'd think about them as forms of inequality. So you know, poverty and all of those sorts of things. So um, this new context provoked a new way of trying to understand social order, a new, well, what was called a science for studying society. And so um, I might actually, I'll skip back to that. So. This very much started with um, our first ever sociologist who, well, he was the first by virtue of the fact that he coined the term sociology, Auguste Comte, who was a French sociologist, and he essentially was a pioneer of putting together a science of studying society. So he based this new discipline of sociology on the hard sciences, biological sciences, so just in the exact same way as you can go out there and use the scientific method to observe and test hypotheses and discover facts about the natural world, he argued you can, that you can do the same thing in the social world. So you can apply the scientific method, you can you know, observe, create hypotheses, experiment, all of those sorts of things, and discover social laws. So this type of perspective um, is called positivism, and that's essentially the view that you can discover the truth of something by going out there and using your senses and using your logic to interact with the world. And so um, that stands in very strong opposition to, um, to things like you know, subjectivism, so the idea that knowledge is you know, subjectively created or the world is viewed in different ways from different perspectives. So um, someone like Comte would argue that there's really, you know, there's a certain truth to social life that can be discovered. So very much, um, very much based on a scientific view of the world. And um, this is really, like, we can still see his legacy today in the way that we we speak of sociology as a social science. So that really is kind of taking its cues from biological sciences. So um, a kind of overview of early sociological theory, which I'll speak about um, each of these figures and each of these traditions. So this is just to give you a bit of a roadmap of um, what I'm going to be speaking to you about. So essentially we have Comte and then um, his kind of a person coming after him who I'll speak to you about, Emile Durkheim, and they were working in a tradition that we can call functionalism. So they were trying to discover, essentially, the functions that certain social behaviors fulfilled for society. So trying to figure out, essentially, like how does society function properly? How do different actors and different institutions, different social structures contribute to the functioning of society? They viewed, um, people that stood outside of society as dysfunctional in many ways. Um, so that was really the kind of level, that was the focus there. And then next to, um, next to them we have Karl Marx, who was our, our um, who developed Marxism, obviously. And he is really the forefather of what we can call critical or conflict sociology. So sociology that's not only trying to observe and understand the social world as it is, but is also trying to understand how could this be different? What is, what is wrong or like who is you know, not benefiting, who is benefiting? 
from the current social order and how could this be different? How could we change it? So he was really, really the forefather of that particular perspective, which is still very large within, um, within sociology today. We do have people that work as and call themselves neo-Marxists, but the, um, the perspective of critical sociology is much, much broader than that. It spans far beyond Marxism. And then finally, we have Max Weber, a, a kind of early German sociologist who, in, in contrast to these other figures who are looking at a very kind of high level, we're looking at social structures, Weber was more interested in interpersonal interaction, in kind of the level of everyday life, the level of you know, interpersonal, like one-on-one -on -one or small group interactions rather than whole societies. So he is um, what we can think of as kind of a forefather of symbolic interactionism, which focuses on the kind of micro everyday level. So um, these are our two kind of social levels that we can think about. Macro is a kind of a large scale, so the level of whole societies, looking at social structures, whereas micro is smaller scale, so it's looking at, looking at everyday interactions. And micro perspectives are much, much more likely to be focusing on meaning making, so you know, what, and also like perspectives of individuals. So how do people understand their lives? How is this certain thing meaningful to them? What does this mean to them? Those types of things. So we'll be talking much more about that as well. So um, when we talk about the, the kind of classic canon of sociology, the classic figures, three names always come up. And I think it's really important to keep in mind um, that there, are, there were other sociologists who were working at this time, and there's other figures who could have easily, in some ways, have become part of this canon. So in some ways, um, the choice of these three figures is somewhat arbitrary. It's often put down to a kind of mid-20th century sociologist named Talcott Parsons, who I'll speak to you about in a little while, who kind of developed this idea of founding fathers and who wrote about having a sociological canon. But nonetheless, um, no, no matter how we kind of got to these three figures, they are the, the three kind of founding sociologists who are cited the most. Their work still influences a lot of work that's happening at present. And so to understand the discipline and to understand you know, why people are working in the areas that they're working in and the perspectives that have developed out of them, it's important to, to have some sense of each of these figures and kind of where they're coming from. So um, we'll start with Durkheim, who focused predominantly on what we can call questions of social order. So um, much like Comte, Durkheim was focused on trying to understand kind of social facts. So he tried to study um, society in a kind of scientific way, and he was quite interested working within what we could call a functionalist tradition. He was interested in the question of social order. So how do we have social order in these newly industrialized, urbanized societies during the Industrial Revolution where people are living in close proximity in poor conditions? How do we maintain social order? How do we, how do we stop all of this from just disintegrating into anarchy? And for him, he kind of located the, the nexus of social order in the way in which a society was constructed. So um, he argued that kind of earlier societies, so when humans lived in smaller kind of clans or tribal groups, those societies had a natural kind of solidarity. People were bound together because they were very inter interdependent on each other, but also because those societies were incredibly homogenous. So, Everyone was very, very similar. Everyone was, in many ways, a bit of a jack of all trades. People could fulfill lots of different social functions. They were what we could call an undifferentiated society. But then, obviously, by the time we get to the Industrial Revolution, this has changed quite a lot. We're living in big cities. And so he argued that, essentially, at this stage, we needed to find new ways to create solidarity, to bind us together, to have social order, 
and he argued that social order was based on interdependence. So if everyone was doing a different job in society, then they're all dependent on each other. So if you're the person who makes shoes, then you're dependent on the person who's you know, the butcher and the person who's running a fruit and veg market or all of those sorts of things. You're all dependent on each other and that creates a certain solidarity. But he also argued that the kind of social structure relied on shared values. And he illustrated that in a really kind of interesting study, which is an absolute classic in, um, in sociology now. So he, he studied suicide, which is obviously something we can think of as intensely personal. It's an incredibly kind of personal, isolated act. But Durkheim, he, he wanted to look at the way in which we can think of suicide also as a social phenomena, something that had really strong social determinants beyond interpersonal things, determinants on the kind of scale of whole societies. So he essentially compared um, a range of different countries looking at suicide rates, and he found, he found essentially that um, suicide rates in predominantly Protestant um, countries were much, much higher than predominantly Catholic countries. So somewhere like Denmark, which at that time was almost entirely Protestant, had a suicide rate four times higher than very Catholic Italy. So obviously there's other factors, but he argued that a contributing factor here was the kind of level of you know, norms and value consensus. So Catholicism emphasizes having you know, a church community, whereas Protestantism emphasizes an individual relationship with one's God. So it doesn't really give shared norms and values and doesn't bind people together in the same way. So um, he also looked at some other factors and found that uh, married people committed suicide a lot less often than unmarried people, so that was further further fuel for his argument about kind of social integration being and like shared norms being kind of a buffer against that. And um, essentially, he, he also kind of quite interestingly found that suicide declined in times of war, in times of natural disaster. And he argued that these types of things bound people together and kind of gave them a shared meaning, a shared cause. So um, then our next, um, our next kind of early sociologist is probably the one that you're most likely to have heard of quite a bit before, Karl Marx. And so I'm, I always find it so interesting to, um, to teach Marx just because we think of him so much as, you know, we associate him with the Communist Manifesto, we think of him as the father of communism, but really if you look at, if you look at his writing, if you look at the type of theory that he's worked on, he focused predominantly on capitalism. So he wrote so much more about contemporary, or at that time, contemporary capitalism than he ever wrote about communism. And so really, we can think of him as a theorist of capitalism in many ways. And so um, Marx, as, as kind of an, a real kind of forefather of critical or conflict sociology, instead of looking at social order and how things were bound, how people were bound together to live in a society like Durkheim, he looked at the kind of points of conflict between people. He had a view of these conflicts as being based on one social class, and a social class for him was based on one's orientation to or relationship with the means of production. So um, for him, he had this three-part schema of, of social class, so the working class, um, essentially were those who were, at this time, working in factories under very unfavorable conditions. They really had control only over their own labor power, and that was often exploited, so arguably they often did not really have control over that. Um, the, the ruling class, so those that were in parliament and owned the means of production, owned the factories and such, they they had control over the means of production. So they were the ones that you know, owned all of the, the factories, the apparatuses that could manufacture things to themselves. So they really had control here. 
And then um, between that, we have the bourgeoisie, the, the kind of middle class who sit between those two and have small businesses play an entrepreneurial role. Um, so essentially, Marx argued that if you were born into a certain social class, you were very, very likely to live out your life and die in that social class. Your children would continue in that social class. And that was, that was very true at that point in history. It's still, um, I think, truer than, um, than ideas like the like American dream would have us believe. But at this time in history, there was really very, very little social mobility. So he essentially argued that this system was inherently exploitative, inherently unfair. And so he focused on essentially the way in which, the way in which um, by the working class, by laboring in this way, were, were kind of alienated from what they produced. So he argued that you know, by going into a factory every day and you know, doing some kind of small tasks, so rather than you know, being an artisan who creates vases and has control over their work and decides what to do, the working class now who are working in factories, they you know, probably went into a factory and worked at a loom and they stood there all day you know, pushing the loom and moving this and that and then pulling it back and that was their job. So essentially, these, this type of work is not very fulfilling, it's not very meaningful. So Marx's argument was that by doing this type of mechanized, repetitive work, workers became alienated from the labor that they were doing. They were alienated from what they were producing. And I think a good example of this is um, if you think of the chef in a kitchen, so I used to work in a restaurant, and um, the, the chef in the kitchen would just stand there all day cooking, and he'd have like heaps of steaks that he was trying to get to the right temperature and such. And then one day he walked through the restaurant to get out, rather than going out the main way. And as he was walking past the bar, he said to me, you know, it's so weird to see people actually eating the food, because I've kind of stopped thinking about the fact that once I, you know, put it over there, it goes out, and it's something that people sit and eat and such he'd become so disconnected from the work that he was doing. For him, it had shrunk down to, you know, this one's been on one minute, this one's been on two minutes, and it wasn't really you know, something that was going to go out and be a product in the wider world. So that's the type of, the type of alienation that, essentially, Marx is talking about. He also felt that people were alienated from the type of work that they were doing, the type of things they were producing, because of the conditions that they worked in. So, essentially, um, they just as they you know, didn't really feel particularly valued for their skills, they they weren't particularly valued for their skills by by factory owners and such who could replace them very very easily. So, by breaking tasks down into you know, small increments, smaller tasks that renders people replaceable and is another kind of instrument of alienation. So essentially, um, Marx argues that you know, if you think about the kind of picture that he's painting for the working class, you'd think like, okay, that sounds absolutely awful. Why do people not just refuse to work in these conditions? Why do they not do something about this? And his argument was that essentially the working class were compensated for this alienation through things, through some of the kind of small good things in life. So like sex, religion, consumption. Um, and this is where Marx's very famous quote, um, religion is the opium of the masses, comes from. He's saying that it keeps people docile, it keeps them within this system, it keeps them from rising up and, and challenging things. So essentially, um, and this is kind of, this is something that I'd like you to, to hopefully take away from, from this particular focus on Marx. Essentially, when Marx was thinking about social change or thinking about how things happen in societies, how societies develop, his explanation for social change is based on what we can call a base superstructure distinction. So if the base of a society is the economic relations, the means of production, the type of work that people are doing and their relationships with each other through work, so whether they're the owners of the means of production, whether they're working in factories, 
And then the superstructure is essentially everything else, the kind of the realm of culture and ideas. Marx argues that the kind of superstructure of a society, all of the, the ways in which society is organized, the ways where our ideas and such come from, he argues that it's all coming from the economic base. So essentially what that means is that all social developments can be traced back to the kind of results of these economic means of production. So he saw the root of social change as being within that. So if you look throughout history, um, for instance, he wrote a really interesting text on the French Revolution where he traced that back and essentially argued that the French Revolution occurred due to, due to kind of economic factors rooted very much within the, the way in which labor and production was organized in French society at that time. And that was the genesis, that was the point that created you know, other ideas about the ruling class being awful and lazy and all of those sorts of things. So really that's his, um, that's his explanation of social change. So that's really, you know, from looking at that, you can probably have quite a good sense of why Marx would be arguing that in order to have a revolution, we really need to start there. We need to you know, change the way that production is organized and he essentially argues that all else will follow. So I'm not sure personally how much I believe this argument. Um, I, I um, used to have experiences kind of arguing with members of the socialist alternative um, on my old university campus. So those are people that are kind of contemporary Marxists and I'd argue like, yes, you know, we need to look at like class relations. We need to look at the type of work people are doing. But what about all these other issues? What about gender equality? And essentially the, the argument that I was given about that was, well, once we've had the revolution and once everything's been sorted out, that'll work itself out. Like it'll, you know, the revolution will fix all of those things. So I'm still, I'm still not completely sure how much I agree with that, but nonetheless. So essentially, um, Marx believed that society kind of evolved in epochs. So there were certain you know, types of societies, certain phases that society must go through. So he essentially saw a, um, a socialist or communist society as the logical end point, the kind of natural conclusion of human society. So this is what we can call a teleological view of, of society, of social change. So he, he really felt that communism and socialism were inevitable. So essentially, um, Marx argued that the working class and the ruling class, so as a conflict sociologist, he's looking at social conflicts, he's looking at kind of struggles and such, and as, as a, what we could call a historical materialist or someone who you know, locates social change in the economic base rather than the superstructural kind of realm of ideas and you know, opinions and such, um, but as someone working in that way, he really saw the kind of crux of this conflict between the, um, the workers and the ruling class as being a conflict over what he called surplus value. So this is quite a simple idea. It essentially just is referring to, you know, if you think about how much it costs to produce a t-shirt, for instance, it might cost you 28 cents per t-shirt when you look at um, materials, labor, and shipping costs. And then that t-shirt might go to H&M and be sold for, I don't know, $20. And so the surplus value there is quite a lot of money. So that would be like you know, $19 and something cents of surplus value that is kind of put on top of, um, put on top of the, the, what, what it costs to actually produce these things. So for Marx, um, his argument was that the workers want this surplus value to come back to them in some form in wages. So you know, if there's a huge markup on these types of things, then 
they want that money to, to come back to them because they're producing that value. And then for the, the ruling class, those that were owning the means of production, owning the factories and such, they, they would you know, argue that that's theirs to keep, that that's um, you know, a profit that they're making by being the business owners, by taking the economic risk to start this business, by covering the startup costs and all of those sorts of things. So really, um, for Marx, the nature of class struggle was a fight over this means of production. So really, um, if we look at, essentially, how this might play out in contemporary society, we can see that, um, you know, really, it's, it's necessary. Like the, I think the thing that Marx points out that is really interesting is that the, the working class and the ruling class, they're very much reliant on each other. Even though they're struggling, they're completely reliant on each other. So, you know, if, um, you know, if in contemporary Australia now we had mass unemployment, yes, that would be terrible for, you know, those of us that are out here working for wages, but it would also be really terrible for those that own the means of production, that owned organisations and such, if, if people weren't working, because they do need, they need that labour to create value in many cases. And without this, then um, also the people that are creating these types of things, they're also consumers, so their wages are then used to purchase these goods, so this system is very much reliant on them. And this is really the crux of why um, why Marx was arguing that the working class should rise up and have a revolution, because his argument was that you know, the working class, the ruling class is dependent on the working class. The working class actually create the value. They, you know, in his opinion, create this surplus value that the, the ruling class then extract. And so, essentially, he felt that they, in, in many ways, were doing all the work, had all of the power, and could you know, rise up and do better, have a better society, a more equal society. So, um, essentially, Marx, um, as you can see from his focus on the kind of economic base of society as determining all other kind of forms of social change, he was very much focused on social structures. So he was trying to understand how these social structures impact on people's everyday lives. But then, arguably because of this, he focused on this kind of macro level in favor of focusing on the everyday level of you know, people's everyday lives. He didn't look so much at the kind of micro level of interactions and such. Um, essentially, he, he kind of didn't really give much credit to the idea that structures are kind of the sum of their parts. So they're the sum of people making decisions, people interacting. And he, his theory doesn't do very well at understanding you know, the kind of micro level. And so from there, we can move on to, um, to Max Weber, who kind of had a different approach to understanding, um, understanding social life, essentially. And in contrast to Marx, rather than, rather than arguing that all of social change originated in the economic base, came from the kind of productive relations between people, came from you know, the world of work, essentially, he argued that you know, much of change originates in the kind of superstructure, in the world of ideas and ideology and values, especially. So essentially, um, he illustrates this point in a really, really interesting way in his very famous essay, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. So um, I actually recommend, if you are interested in, um, in reading something by one of our classic figures, then this is, this is the one to read. So The Protestant Ethic is, it, it's a bit over 100 pages, which might be kind of long in in the kind of context of what we read today, but in the context of um, you know, the fact that Marx's magnum opus is like three giant volumes, it's, it was kind of short in the grand scheme of things, and it's also written in a relatively accessible way, so it's an enjoyable read, and you wouldn't be completely battling through it. <laughs> so I, I definitely recommend. Um, 
Yep, so essentially in this work, Marx is talking about the way in which uh, the development of capitalism was you know, very much encouraged or at least occurred alongside the development of, kind of Protestant forms of religiosity. So um, Weber argued that, um, that Protestants essentially um, were very much focused on on kind of this-worldly factors, on having an individual relationship with God. And he was actually particularly interested in, um, in a kind of sect of Protestants called Calvinists who believe in pre predeterminism. So this essentially means that you know, who is kind of saved and going to heaven and who is not is already determined by the time you're born. So you're either one part of God's chosen people or you're not. So um, this particular group of Protestants, they were very much focused on trying to discover or prove to themselves that they were part of this chosen group of people by, um, by being successful in their kind of lives on earth as a sign of God's favor. So they felt that you know, if things were working out well for them, then that was a sign that you know, God favoured them and that things were going to go well in the afterlife as well. So essentially, um, essentially Weber argues that by bringing you know, religious ideas into the everyday and by mixing together this kind of religiosity with these ideas of you know, accumulating wealth um, as an end within itself, as a way of proving God's favour, this very much supported the development of a capitalist system in which you know, we're oriented towards continued growth, we're oriented towards accumulating capital. So essentially the point that, that I'm making here about um, Weber and the Protestant ethic is that he's arguing that you know, the, the kind of realm of ideas and values could push forward developments such as capitalism, which we can locate in what Marx would call the kind of base, the, the economic relations that underpin social life. So for him, the, the kind of um, social change could be pushed forward from this completely different place. So that's in complete contrast to what Marx was arguing. Um, Weber was also very much focused on looking at how con contemporary industrialized societies, so for him, um, he was working in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, so he was very much interested in looking at how since the Enlightenment there was a turn towards what he'd call rationalization, so trying to like, use scientific methods to discover things, um, trying to use kind of logic and reason and all of those sorts of things. And he, he argued that as, as our societies developed further, there was a progression of you know, more and more kind of rationalization and we blocked out things that did not really fit within this. And um, that's, that's where his, his very famous phrase, the, um, the kind of iron cage of rationality, the iron cage of modernity comes from because he's essentially arguing that you know, by focusing on you know, rationality, means ends rationalization and such, we block out you know, other parts of life. We lose superstitions, we lose faith, we lose you know, other types of values and such. So he was very much interested in, in what values and religiosity and all of those sorts of things could contribute to our lives. And um, he was also in, in contrast to Marx, and this is something that you'll, um, you'll come across again in the week on social class, when you look at Marx versus Weber on class, so I won't dwell on it too much here, but um, he approached the idea of class a bit differently. He was interested in status rather than class. So um, an example of this is that you know, in contemporary times, coal miners, or we could say fly and fly out workers who go to the mines, um, they earn quite a lot of money, but that's not a job that we'd associate with the high social status. So if a fly and fly out worker earns as much as a GP, there's still one that we would see as having a bit of a higher status in society. So Weber was interested less in, in money and more in the status that was associated 
which you know, often corresponded with money, but not always. Um, so essentially, um, Weber was in many ways less focused on social structures than Marx. He was focused more on the kind of individual, everyday um, aspects of social interaction. He was interested in looking inside social structures and trying to see how people made meaning from their lives, how people viewed their own lives, the role of values and ideas in driving forward social change. So if we're thinking about the kind of broad takeaway messages about each of these figures, then this would be it for, um, for Weber. He's very much focused on, focused on the kind of superstructure realm of um, values, ideas, meaning making. He's interested in subjective life. And so he, um, he even, he was even focused on trying to kind of understand the social world through well, he would instruct people to kind of place themselves in the position of the people under examination. So we can think of this as quite a radical departure from you know, someone like Auguste Comte's um, early positivist social science in which he was out to discover social facts and discover these concrete things about the social world through you know, going out and observing and testing and figuring out like, yes, this is how this works, this is how this works, this is inherently the truth of this. So Weber, very much in contrast to that, was interested in less in objective truth than in subjective meaning making and how people understood their world from different perspectives. And he also instructed people to be reflexive about their own value judgments as social researchers. So as well as trying to put yourself in the shoes of the people that you're researching, he instructed to try to understand your own orientation towards your research. And I think this is a, a really important piece of advice. Um, and this is something that we'll return to quite a bit, but I think um, you know, despite this type of advice and despite awareness of um, you know, trying to be aware of your own assumptions and such, in a lot of early sociological work, we can see that there's very strong moral judgments made about, um, about the people that were being researched, essentially. So um, a, quite a famous sociologist from the, um, the kind of mid-20th century named Norbert Elias, who um, worked in England, uh, essentially, I think it was Leicester, University of Leicester, um, some academics based there, which I think this has got to be one of the funnest things about working in a, an older, like very historic university. Essentially, they were doing some kind of tidying in the old sociology department, were looking in archives, and they discovered Norbert Elias's old kind of research notes on this big neighborhood study he did where him and some of his research assistants and such essentially went to people's houses all over this one neighborhood and tried to understand, like get a snapshot of social life at that time. So, um, because this is the time before you know, audio recorders, if we interview people now, we audio record it and then we have their exact statements. But at this time, um, the researchers were making handwritten notes. And so um, the, the researchers, the kind of contemporary researchers were interested in you know, looking at how research was done back at this time, the types of reflections they were making, and essentially they found that a lot of the notes were full of these really mean judgments about the people. So, you know, the mother is dirty and lazy, and you know, the sister has this in her hair and can't get a job, or just very like judgmental things. And um, it was very clear that you know, this, the researchers had their own orientation towards these people and they were not able to, to try to be reflexive about that, to try and step outside of that, to try to understand, understand the lives of people in this neighborhood in their own terms. So again, um, that's very much something that we will, we will return to because reflexivity within the research process is something that we try to do relatively well with in, in this day and age. But just to summarize um, this part of the lecture before I let you have a bit of a brain break and we reconvene to talk about some contemporary theorists. Uh, so essentially, 
Marx, Weber and Durkheim each continue to exert quite a lot of influence on contemporary sociology. So um, I know, for instance, I used some of, um, some of Weber's work in my PhD thesis. So it might seem counterintuitive um, that we'd still be using work from over 100 years ago, but there is still a lot of people that are working on these ideas, and especially working within the traditions that these researchers created. So just to emphasize again, um, essentially, the, in order to understand sociology and to understand the social sciences in general, it is, you know, it is necessary to, to at least briefly go back to the start and, and think about what was happening there and where these ideas came from and such. Um, but as well, um, these, these theorists all had kind of quite a, quite a structuralist bent and they were quite interested in the study of kind of conflict within society. Um, even Durkheim was looking at you know, those that did not fit within the social order, those that were you know, deviant outside the social order and such. So they all had a similar focus in that way. And um, as we'll see when I return and speak to you about some contemporary theorists and some new areas of research in sociological theory, um, things have moved on from that in some ways. So um, I'll give you maybe like around about 10 minutes to take a break. So if you could come back at about five past, um, five past one, then we can get back to it. Yeah. <laughs> 
especially is very positive. And someone like um, someone like that is quiet in that way. I'm just trying to marry up what I'm hearing in criminology. It's a good idea to think about how how you're how you're learning in each of your courses to like So, uh, now we're moving on to, to having a look at social theory in more contemporary times. So, what are some areas that people are working on more recently and um, how, how can we see the legacy of our classic theorists in, in the work of our more contemporary theorists? So, um, we've, we've kind of seen so far that you know, we can divide, um, we can divide our, our classical theorists into those that are working on a kind of macro perspective, looking at overall society, social structures, looking at the macro level of life. And then we can look at those who focus on a micro perspective. So um, we saw Weber as an early example of someone who is interested in looking at interpersonal communications, looking at the level of individual life, looking at how people make meaning within their lives, how they understand things, how things like values and religiosity can you know, drive forward social change. So um, we're going to look a bit more at that. We're going to look at some more micro-level perspectives, focusing particularly on um, symbolic interactionism and phenomenology, which 
are each really interesting with fantastic, interesting histories. And um, then within the kind of macro structural perspective, we're going to look at, um, well, so far we have looked at kind of conflict sociology, really epitomized by the work of Marx, who was looking at, you know, our kind of social world as really characterized by this conflict between the ruling class and the working class, this conflict over the, the kind of surplus value from their labor. And so we're, um, we're going to move on to look a bit more at the functionalist or what can be called the consensus view. So this is stemming from the work of, um, of someone like Durkheim. So Durkheim was really interested in how we create social order, how, you know, how we kind of be a society, um, the role of of kind of deviance within social order, all of those sorts of things. So um, we can build on that by looking at more recent proponents of the, the kind of functionalist tradition. So this table is a useful kind of summary, which I'm not going to go over now, but if you're feeling a bit lost, I recommend having a look through that maybe after this lecture. And I'll start, um, I'll start with Talcott Parsons, one of our our kind of key proponents of the functionalist perspective. So um, essentially, Parsons and functionalism as a perspective more broadly is, you know, as Durkheim was, very much concerned with social order, with how, how societies fit together. So in Durkheim's language, that was all about social, so, social solidarity, the bonds that tie us together. And um, for, for Parsons, he took a similar approach and he used an analogy of society as an organism, as something that has separate parts that all do some kind of work, have some kind of function that contributes to the whole, that keeps the organism alive. So essentially he was interested in discovering what, what social function, what social role do, do different people fulfill and um, that's, that's kind of the schema, the overall apparatus that he used to understand societies. He understood them through the kind of functions that people served to, to kind of fit into the society. And he was also quite interested in, in values. He essentially argued that although different parts of societies serve different functions necessarily to contribute to a whole, especially in you know, large-scale societies, in large urban cities, we need some level of functional differentiation to, to function properly. Not everyone can gather food and make things and play caring roles. We need to divvy up those roles somehow. But he argued, much like Durkheim, that Essentially, in these types of societies, people are held together by shared values, by some kind of value consensus, about, by shared normative ideas of how the world should be. And he argued that those who did not fit within this kind of normative view of a good society, of how we should be, were labeled deviant and were seen as being dysfunctional for societies, as eroding the kind of proper functioning. So, um, so essentially, essentially Parsons kind of used that schema for understanding social roles and used the idea of deviance to understand roles that went a bit outside the social functions. And one kind of popular criticism of his perspective is that you know, without a bit of deviance or without pushing up against um, social norms and pushing, you know, pushing forward through social values, we can't really have very much social change. So a popular criticism of functionalist perspectives is that there's not really much role for social change. If you don't have a huge degree of role, a degree of space for conflict, then it's hard to understand how things could be different. So um, you know, if a society is full of people fulfilling functions, and if a society is operating properly, then why would things change? Where does social change come from? So that's kind of one of the, one of the criticisms, one of the issues we can have with, um, with functionalism. So essentially, um, Parsons' work is 
is still very much used. It's used by, um, by some contemporary sociologists. It's used quite a lot in the US. And due to his focus on, um, on human capital and you know, dysfunction, his work is used in some cases in human resource management. It's quite helpful in, um, in the study of things like organizations, especially. Because if you think about it, organizations are, are kind of comprised of you know, a bounded group that, to some degree at least, all have a shared goal, the success of the organization, making a profit, all of those sorts of things. And you know, because of that, studying, studying the functions that each part of the organization fulfills and the, their success in fulfilling those functions is quite a helpful approach. It's a helpful apparatus for understanding an organization, whereas um, that's perhaps a little bit less helpful for understanding a whole society because we can ask the question of, you know, does, does a society really have shared goals that we're trying to kind of serve functions to strive towards beyond simply the continuation of society? We can question um, the degree to which there truly is a consensus on you know, norms and values. So we can see, um, I think we can see that's not always the case. So again, um, some critiques of functionalism are that it is very much deterministic, it doesn't really allow space for things to be different, it doesn't allow much space for thinking about social change. Um, it also focuses very much on the positive kind of functions of aspects of social life. So, um, for instance, at the time that Parsons was writing, um, he looked at how the, he was quite interested in the nuclear family. So, you know, essentially, um, mum, dad, and 2.5 kids, like, think the Simpsons. How that type of family unit was very much functional for the, the kind of emerging mid 20th century economy. So, if you think about it, the nuclear family, they're, they're, they're transportable. Like, if you lived in a huge extended you know, family structure where you were you know, situated among like, you know, grandparents and all sorts of things, then it's very difficult for you to move, for you to relocate where work is. Whereas, you know, if there's just like the four of you or the five of you as this little household unit, then you, know, you can relocate quite easily. You're transportable. And the division of labor within the household at that time was also viewed as serving social functions as there was a kind of male breadwinner model where the man would you know, go out, Homer Simpson style, and you know, go do his work, have his job, and the woman would stay at home and do domestic labor, caring labor, all of those sorts of things. So that was viewed as this kind of functional family unit. But that type of reading of social life doesn't really leave much space for the fact that um, you know, perhaps that wasn't an ideal situation for many women. So there's not really that much role or that much room within this to, to, critique, um, to critique the way that things are. Um, so then we can move on to some of the, um, so that's our kind of the kind of macro perspective we're looking at, this, this kind of theory of the whole of society, but we can start to look at um, some of the kind of micro theories, which especially over the 20th century really came to the fore in very interesting ways. Um, and these are theories of you know, interpersonal interaction, theories of individual meaning making, that are looking at the kind of micro level of social life. So we can start with symbolic interactionism, which is the theory that contends that studying social interaction, so interpersonal, small group interaction, is a really key to understanding human practices. So essentially, to understand the nature of a society, to understand social life, we don't look simply at the kind of large, grand scale. We have to look at, you know, we have to zero in and look at people's everyday lives, look at individuals look at small-scale interaction. So essentially, um, symbolic interactionism is based on the notion that social reality is constructed by individuals through 
through their interactions, through their subjective processes of meaning making, through words and gestures, through language. So it's something that is negotiated over time. And just as, just as these interactions are negotiated over time, symbolic interactionists would argue that the self is not this inherent fixed thing. It's something that is negotiated in different social interactions. And so um, symbolic interactionists are particularly interested in the way in which people kind of change their behavior in front of different social groups. So you can think about the different ways in which you might act in different situations. So yeah, the way that I'm acting now is very, very different to how I might act if I'm you know, like out for a drink with friends, for instance. <laughs> there are certain things in each context that would be appropriate and would be inappropriate. And we can think about, I'm sure you can think of examples in your own lives. So does anyone have a particularly good example that comes to mind that you'd like to share? That's, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. That's really good. Work party compared to house party. Yeah, exactly. And so you know, the things that would be appropriate in each context are completely different. And we can think about that because, essentially, we're, we're in front of different audiences. So um, there, are, there are kind of t a few main theorists who are focused on um, who are trying, to, trying to understand the meaning of kind of small-scale interactions. So George Herbert Mead is one of them. But then another, which I think is, um, is particularly interesting, is Irvin Goffman. And Goffman's work really, really speaks to the example of um, you know, being at a house party versus a work party. So Goffman developed what was called the dramaturgical perspective. So he, he explained social life and everyday interactions using the metaphor of an actor on a stage. So for him, um, he argued that for all of us, when we're, when we're in front of groups of people, we are essentially thinking about who our audience is. We're thinking about you know, who, we're, who we're performing for. And there's also a division between, for him, a front stage and a backstage. So if, um, if for myself and my working life, my front stage is here when I'm out here teaching, my backstage would be my office, which is an absolute disaster. And <laughs> it was very much you know, where I just like throw things and like shove papers. And it's not really intended for many people to, to see that. It's not really part of what I would put forward as a professional image. And you can think of um, the backstage as where you, where you prepare for kind of front stage performances. So backstages can be many different things. So if we go with the example of you know, a house party or an office party or a work party, then your backstage might be you know, when you're at home getting ready, like putting makeup on, listening to music and such. That's not really, you know, if some random person from your work like walked into your house then, it would feel incredibly uncomfortable because that's not really a circumstance that is meant for them. You're not prepared. And so you can have kind of backstage situations that involve groups of people. So if you think about the way in which, um, you know, if you have work meetings, then the way in which your work meetings look when it's a small group of you and you're you know, talking about something that's like very internal to your workplace and there's not really anyone kind of higher up or anyone external, the types of ways in which you talk to each other is so different to what you'd say you know, if your boss is coming along to give a presentation at the meeting. So you can think of front stage and backstage in that sense as well. Um, Goffman himself, uh, he, he kind of, the genesis of this idea really came from his observation of a restaurant. So he was really interested. He was, um, I think, staying at some kind of resort or something um, while he was traveling. And there was a restaurant in which some of, someone kept kind of propping open the kitchen door and it was supposed to be propped open so the waiters could get through, but the staff working in the kitchen kept moving the thing that was propping open the door because essentially um, the, the staff in the kitchen didn't really want the, 
the customers to be hearing their conversations and such. They felt really uncomfortable about that because they'd you know, be in the kitchen, like, you know, trying bits of the food and making fun of the customers and all of those sorts of things. Um, so Goffman was really interested in how, how that door kind of symbolised a boundary between a front stage and a backstage and how these professional kind of visages were put on by the staff when they came out there and then they'd go back into the kitchen and be like, ha, ah, did you see that lady? So that's kind of where he was getting all of that from. And so he argued that, um, you know, through this, because we, you know, we look at our audience and we, we kind of tailor the way in which we act to them and to what we know of them, in that way, he argues that our identities are socially constructed. They're constructed by the kind of information that we get from a particular environment. So you can think about, um, in contemporary times, some examples of some of the difficulties you might experience um, trying to perform to different audiences on somewhere like social media, or if you've um, ever heard the phrase like context collapse, where you have a bunch of people from different parts of your life that are all somehow in one place and it feels really weird. <laughs> through, through Goffman's work, you can think of that as you know, having many different audiences who are, in a way, kind of trying to provoke different performances all in the one place. And it's an uncomfortable experience because we do, we perform different parts of ourselves to different people. They're intended for different people. So I think um, Goffman's really interesting in that way. And another kind of contemporary or relatively contemporary theorist who's looking at Looking at more the level of everyday interactions is Ali Hofschild. So um, again, if you're looking for, for something, to, something extra to read, I, I really recommend um, the second one here, The Managed Heart by Hofschild. Really, really interesting book. So Ali Hofschild is essentially, she was one of the front runners in the sociology of emotions, the study of emotions not as psychological states, but emotions as things that have social determinants, emotions as something that is inherently social. So for her, um, the research that she was doing uh, for the managed heart, she was looking at, um, at flight attendants who were at this stage called air hostesses, and she looked at the way in which, you know, essentially um, air hostesses, no matter what someone does on the plane, the, the joke is that they're always, they always seem incredibly cheerful and professional. They seem really friendly, really happy, even though I sometimes look at them and I'm thinking, like, are your ears not doing that? Like, how are you? Like, all, the, all I can do is kind of sit here and feel awful when you seem to be quite happily doing a job and smiling. So she was looking at the way in which Essentially, certain jobs, especially public-facing service jobs, call upon us to not only kind of perform a certain type of self, a presentation of self, but they call on us to perform certain emotions. They call on us to do what she would call emotional labor. So they call on us to you know, not only act like we're happy to, to see customers and such, but over time there's it's kind of a sense that we should genuinely be feeling that way, that we, we kind of perform that to the extent that you know, we start to internalise it, we start to actually try to feel these things. And she kind of takes a bit of a neo-Marxist reading on this and argues that through this process, through the kind of commercialization of feeling, we become somewhat alienated from our own emotions. She also does some really interesting work um, She's a, a kind of feminist scholar, and she does work on essentially women and trying to balance some um, paid work and kind of care and domestic work and the way in which the kind of management of time and scheduling that one does within their home can pick up dimensions of the type of work that's done in the workplace, and there can be a blurred boundary between the two. So, um, yeah, essentially. Really, really interesting, um, really, really interesting work, which is still used quite a lot, um, quite a lot now. Her work's very contemporary. And um, so moving on from 
symbolic interactionism to our kind of second contemporary kind of micro approach. We have phenomenology. So phenomenology is essentially the study of consciousness. So if symbolic interactionism is looking at interactions between people, so you know, interactions in involving more than one person and how meaning is made through those interactions, then phenomenology is focusing on almost the individual psyche, on our individual thought processes. It's looking at how we kind of internal to ourselves create meaning from our world. How we kind of, you know, how we make our social identities by reflecting on the world, by these kind of processes of thinking. So um, Edmund Husserl is the kind of forefather of phenomenology, but you can see the kind of phenomenological tradition through a lot of continental philosophy, if anyone's interested in or taking philosophy courses. Um, some phenomenologists would be Jean-Paul Sartre and um, Martin Heidegger, the quite famous ones. Um, there's also quite a strong tradition of phenomenological sociology as well, so the study of consciousness, subjective meaning making. And um, just to, to kind of finish us off, um, we also have some, some comparatively new faces in sociology, so essentially, um, just like any other kind of academic discipline or field of research, every few years we, um, we get kind of new faces cropping up. So these are, are some of the quite notable ones. And again, um, if, you, if you are a Bachelor of Social Science student um, or if you're just interested, I think it can be an elective, the second year theory course uh, goes through some of these theorists in much greater detail. So. Pierre Bourdieu is one of them. Um, we also have a few um, academics in sociology here at Newcastle who are kind of Bourdieuian scholars and use Bourdieu's work quite closely. So um, yeah, definitely one that you're <laughs> going to hear quite a bit about one way or another. So um, Bourdieu is essentially a neo-Marxist sociologist and his interest is on in class reproduction. So you're going to hear much more about his work in the week on class in this course. And he is essentially interested. So if Marx viewed class as something that emerged from economic relations and was really determined by economic relations, Bourdieu really departs from that because he's interested in the way in which class is communicated through our patterns of consumption, our lifestyles, and even our embodied ways of being. So he's interested in the kind of unconscious ways in which, in which you can see class, in which class kind of inhabits our bodies, in which it's performed and such. Um, so everyone uses this example, but when I think about kind of embodied performances of class, I always think about, um, I used to live in Melbourne and I lived really close to the Flemington race course. And so when it was um, coming up to Melbourne's Cup, Melbourne Cup Day and all of those events around that, every year I'd see this trail of people kind of bright eyed and bushy tailed in the morning going to the races. And then I'd see them coming home from the races, like carrying shoes and looking a little worse for wear. And I'd always um, noticed that there were men wearing suits who, you could pick the ones who wore a suit every day for work and those that didn't. Those that wore a suit every day looked pretty comfortable and those that didn't were walking like this and kind of looked so uncomfortable. So I think that's a kind of embodied performance of class, a way in which you can tell, you can read kind of class symbols outside of language. Um, so Bourdieu was interested in class struggles in much the way that, um, that Marx was, even though he understood class quite differently. Um, so as I was saying, he was interested in not only kind of someone's access to economic goods, but also their access to kind of cultural knowledge, to things that were socially valued and associated with certain class positions. So, Cultural capital includes things like economic, uh, academic 
knowledge and one's vocabulary, so the way someone speaks, their um, public presentation skills, aesthetic preferences, educational credentials, all sorts of things. So essentially, these kind of cultural factors. Back for Bourdieu, he's a, um, he's a French sociologist who was working um, in France in the kind of 1960s and such. Uh, so for him, an example he'd use would be you know, knowledge of opera and fine wines, but I don't think that that one, maybe the wine thing, but the knowledge of opera probably <laughs> isn't that much of a status symbol anymore. Um, yeah, and so a lot of educational scholars have taken up Bourdieu's work and find Bourdieu's work incredibly helpful for understanding the ways in which different students interact in the classroom. So young people with, um, with high cultural capital are often quite confident in academic spaces. They are used to expressing their opinion. Um, they're used to kind of interacting in certain ways. Um, and they thus perform quite well in classrooms, whereas students from you know, a background that has lower cultural capital perhaps have spent less time developing those types of skills. So the kind of, um, there's intangible skills around, you know, articulating one's opinions and being confident and knowing how to you know, do like presentations and such have been called in educational research, the hidden curriculum. So the kind of untaught things that nevertheless feed into how successful certain students are at school. So, um, that's, I think, one of the really strong places in which, in which cultural capital comes through. Um, and another, another kind of new face is, um, is Anthony Giddens, who's a, a British sociologist who was knighted. He um, is very famous for, um, for having worked a, a little bit with Tony Blair, with Blair's government back in the day. Uh, and essentially, um, Giddens was interested in studying social change. So he was interested in a process called individualization. So essentially the process through which um, people turn away from tradition and towards kind of new ways of living. So he was interested in the result of declining marriage rates, for instance, and um, increasing rates of divorce following no-fault divorce. Um, coming into legislature. And essentially, he was interested in you know, the new ways that we live and the new ideas and like, the new kind of um, things that we orient ourselves towards if we, if we no longer have these traditional, traditional forms of meaning, traditional expectations of what our lives would look like. So if you think about like, you know, back maybe 100 or more years ago, if you were born into a certain social class, you would most likely live your life in that social class. If you had a father who had a certain occupation, there'd be a decent chance that you would be doing something quite similar. Whereas in contemporary times, there is still some element of that, but it's weakened quite significantly. So you know, traditional expectations are you know, kind of weakening in the face of new ways of living. So Giddens is really quite interested in trying to understand how people make their lives in these contexts where there's not really a pathway that's particularly set out for them, where we have to make a lot of decisions about what our lives are going to look like, where you know, essentially we need to work things out very much for ourselves. So um, he's interested in looking at how people strive for what he would call ontological security, so a very kind of deep sense of what we could call existential security in a very kind of uncertain and idiosyncratic world. And he's interested especially in um, how people kind of identify with new things um, to replace traditional forms of identification. So this would be identification with subcultures, for instance. And um, another new figure who's quite interesting is Ulrich Beck. So essentially, um, Essentially, Ulrich Beck um, is famous for developing the concept of the risk society. So Beck, um, 
Beck's popularity is very much, it very much comes from a kind of serendipitous, uh, serendipitous piece of timing. So he, he wrote a book called Risk Society, in which he was discussing the way in which we now you know, face very large scale risks. We face kind of new types of risks within our societies. Um, we have to kind of deal with threats to our very existence. And just before, so the book was already written, but just before it came out uh, in the very late 80s was the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. So as you might imagine, when a book of that nature came out, it was immediately quite popular because of that timing, even though it was written before that, it was a bizarre coincidence. So his book ended up being kind of a piece of foreshadowing. And I think it's quite interesting. Um, I used to teach a course on risk society, sociology of risk and uncertainty, and more and more I found that a lot of students didn't know what the Chernobyl nuclear disaster was, probably because they were a bit young for that. And now that we've had the mini-series, I find that that's no longer an issue. So <laughs> it's nice to have some returning awareness of, of that particular thing. Um, so essentially, uh, Beck made some arguments that were in many ways similar to what Giddens was doing. They were working around about the same time. They've even written together. But Beck was interested in essentially how states have delegated risk away from state institutions and towards families and individuals. So you can see the kind of you know, social delegation of managing the risks that we face in our lives towards the individual through the growth of industries such as insurance is the really big one. So it's now our responsibility to insure against a whole kind of host of really bad things happening to us. I think it's very interesting to see the different types of insurance that have cropped up. So um, a while ago, I was looking for some examples like for a, a lecture on the risk society and changing ideas about risk. And I found the best ones were um, UFO insurance, so insurance against involvement with a UFO in some capacity, and wedding insurance. So insurance for your wedding ceremony in case something goes wrong, which also included change of mind cover. Yeah, so <laughs> I thought that one was, was quite good. Um, yeah, so essentially, um, Beck looks at the way in which we've become in our contemporary societies increasingly focused on managing risk and much like Giddens, he's interested in the ways in which we you know, no longer have a roadmap of expectations for our lives and we have to, in many ways, you know, write our own life path. And for Beck, that's you know, fraught with peril. It's full of lots and lots of you know, risks that we face and have to manage. So he's interested in how we manage and how we deal with these biographical risks and how our kind of orientation to risk has changed over time. So, if you compare pre-modern times when you know, we could think of risk as something that was maybe like the will of the gods or you know, natural disasters as things that just kind of occurred and weren't really linked, you know, weren't linked to tectonic plate shifting. They were maybe linked to anger of the gods because of like immorality or something like that. There was kind of a different understanding of causality and of managing risk. And then we moved to the kind of modern era, the kind of heyday of the 20th century in which we have this, this strong faith that you know, we can manage risks as humans, we can control and understand things fully, we can anticipate risks. And now we move into what, um, what Beck and Giddens would call the late modern era in which our, our kind of faith and our own ability to manage risk is fundamentally undermined. So. Um, Chernobyl was a really kind of watershed moment in that because it showed that essentially you know, these types of large-scale disasters can happen. And that was absolutely reinforced by, um, by the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. That was completely underscored because even, um, even the Chernobyl nu nuclear accident was kind of still surrounded by the veil of the Soviet Union and some countries could kind of tell themselves, like, okay, well, that wouldn't happen to us, but then 
you, know, you see a nuclear disaster occurring in one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world and you suddenly realize that perhaps our ability to predict and control and contain risk is, is somewhat flawed. And I think the best example of this, which really, um, really supports Beck's argument, is some of the results of climate change that we're seeing. So you know, even our ability to predict what climate change is going to look like in the future is very much up for debate. So um, Beck was working right up until his death in 2015, and so he's written on quite a lot of very contemporary topics. He's written on the global financial crisis, on climate change. So if you're interested, um, he's another very interesting person whose work you might want to take a look at. And another more recent one is George Ritzer. So he's, um, he's an interesting example of someone who is kind of working in the tradition and directly from the work of uh, Max Weber. So, he was similarly interested in the process of rationalization, the iron cage of rationality that Weber suggested. As Weber suggested that we're moving increasingly towards a focus on efficiency and formalized social control and trying to find you know, efficient, rational ways of doing things. And Ritzer was interested in kind of how these processes, he called them McDonaldization because they're very much you know, this focus on efficiency, on kind of breaking things into incremental tasks, on figuring out the most efficient possible way to do things. Um, he saw that as quite similar to the way in which labor is organized within McDonald's um, restaurants. And he looked at essentially the way in which this type of logic has extended far beyond just McDonald's to also encompass um, lots of different areas of life. So things like banks and hospitals. Um, there's also quite a lot of people who have written about the McDonaldization of higher education and universities. So if you're, um, if you're kind of feeling like reading something a little bit subversive, then that's always a good one. Uh, and then we have Michel Foucault. So Foucault is, um, is one of the most influential theorists of the 20th century. He, I think it was 2007, he was the most cited person in all of the kind of academic humanities. So his work has been tremendously influential. And um, we don't cover him at great length in this course, but you will definitely cover him in the second year theory course. He also has done really, really fascinating work on um, on kind of crime, deviance, especially a kind of history of the prison system and of punishment in general in a fantastic book called Discipline and Punish. So um, if you're taking criminology courses, you'll probably come across him sooner or later. Um, so he was interested essentially in the way in which, the way in which power operates. So if we take his example of the way in which we kind of discipline people to maintain social control. Um, he was fascinated by the way in which you know, social control used to be maintained by essentially displays of violence. So if we think of executions in kind of pre-modern times, they, they always occurred in public places. There were public executions. People could come and watch. They were often extremely violent. If you read any of the, the kind of depictions of um, guillotining from the French Revolution. They're just really, really violent and gross. Um, if you read any kind of depictions of people being like hung, drawn, and quartered, just yuck, really graphic. So essentially, um, he argued that at that stage in history, social order was maintained by, through fear, through essentially the monarch exerting this, this power through these spectacular shows of violence, through showing people, like, look what I can do to you if you step out of line, don't. And that was what maintained social control. But then if we move forward to the 20th century and into the 21st century, obviously this capital punishment still exists in some countries, but it's done in quite a different way. It's no longer spectacular shows of violence. It's kind of, you know, lethal injection. And here in Australia, we, we don't have the death penalties. So essentially punishment is no longer 
no longer acting upon the body. It's not disciplining someone's body. We're not you know, lining people up and whipping them. Instead, Foucault argues that we are controlling people and exerting power through disciplining their minds. So, you know, the prison is, um, the way that prisons are put together is actually modeled on monasteries. So the focus on solitude, single cells, on conformity, conformity of dress, on you know, having incredibly structured routines, routinized behavior, all of that was kind of taken from monasteries, which I find really fascinating because that is you know, one of the, the best places to think about kind of disciplining, controlling the mind. And so his argument is that essentially the way that power is exerted is like no less forceful, it's just targeted in a different way. He also does some very interesting work on things like surveillance. So a lot of contemporary researchers are using his work to look at you know, new digital forms of surveillance and how, how surveillance impacts the way in which we live our lives and think about ourselves. So very interesting kind of theorist to, to think about. Um, and then finally, in terms of new developments in, in sociological theory to, to keep in mind, the, one of the really big ones would be the emergence of the tradition of feminist sociology. So essentially, um, feminist sociology challenges uh, kind of patriarchal forms of knowledge. It's advocating for kind of, kind of different ways of knowing. It's advocating for the use of the work of female theorists and female sociologists. And so there's quite a lot of sociologists who work in that tradition now, which is fantastic. And we can think of feminist sociology as kind of stemming broadly from a kind of critical conflict position similar to Marx, but obviously there's the focus on gender rather than on class. And then finally, um, I think, this is definitely a good point to end on since we began with some very beardy white men. Uh, we have post-colonial theories. So although sociology began as a very Eurocentric discipline, began in kind of universities in Europe, it's now a global endeavor. And there's, um, there's essentially sociologists who are working in post-colonial countries and working on a kind of you know, bringing bring different voices into the sociological endeavor. And especially, um, one of the things that's really exciting is the development of sociological theories that you know, are applicable to non-Western contexts. So if you think that um, a lot of our early theories were developed to talk about a certain historical stage in Europe, they're probably not particularly useful for understanding social order in contemporary India. So. There's some fantastic work being done at the moment on in the kind of post-colonial space to develop theory that's you know, appropriate for and you know, like made for you know, contexts that aren't you know, European or Eurocentric countries. So essentially, um, that is we can come to the end there. But basically, the take-home messages are really that. Um, so sociology has a diverse and varied history. We can divide it into like macro and micro streams and then some kind of schools of thought they're, they're in. But essentially, if, if you, for some of those sections you thought, like, I do not get what this means, please do not worry. This is a broad overview. And if you'd like to zoom in on one of these theorists and do a bit of extra reading, I recommend that. So thank you so much for coming along. Remember your cheats start this week.
there was the thing about dramaturgy, like the, the are we going into like those sort of like subcategories, like more specific sort of things? Like, would we be looking like in this course? Like, are we looking at things like dramaturgy and like looking at ourselves and everything? Yeah, we will be. We will be kind of zeroing in on some of the session of the theorists kind of as they're going each week. So okay, I think yeah. is one of them. I know yeah. Bodu is going to be focusing quite a lot on the past week. Yeah. It's a post-colonial theorist. So, yeah, we will, kind of as they're relevant to the theme of the week, we will look at them way more. But you're also okay. very welcome to, um, to kind of delve in a bit more in your assignments. Yeah, well, I did, um, because like I still have all of the slides from last year on my computer, and as like we were writing down like um, the document and everything, I was like dramaturgy, because I did a paper on that for like my major exam or whatever, so I just wasn't entirely sure, but thank you for that. I will get out of your way, Thank sorry. How uh, was it? Yeah, good thanks, I think so. Um, um, two hour lecture, something like that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Is it your only one for the week? No, I've got, I've got another, I have to do a review of it tomorrow and a one hour lecture, and I'm doing a week of the one hour lecture on Thursday, so I've got like six hours of lecture. <laughs> People That's who don't have to do that have this glorious image of that because the second time must be so much easier. Yeah, yeah isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, my full sympathy is there. Good luck. <laughs> What I would prefer to do is I'll introduce for maybe four or five minutes and throw straight over to you. You can do your thing. So do you need me? Um, do you need to log in is what I was going to say. Oh, if I could just log into Kahoot directly on this, that would be awesome, rather than using it on my computer.
careful with the um, alcohol. Uh, yeah, also the bandwidth. In the tower. This is the world's fastest internet. Yeah, well, the issue is I just want to use the Wi Fi that's on my laptop. And it, yeah. Okay, okay, two. That mode. Yep. Thanks, we'll load Pierre now. There you are, sir. Go there. Go there, are we live? Yes, we are. Thanks, Pierre. Sorry, was that? Do what you need to do. Oh, cool. Bigger. Thanks, mate. Turn that around. Uh, I'll need 